Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever you're listening. This is Davisville on KDRT-LP 95.7 FM in Davis, California. We live at kdrt.org online. I'm Bill Buchanan, and I thank you for tuning in. Well, many public statues are being defaced, torn down, or removed this summer, and names taken off of buildings as more of America comes to terms with the ingrained racism in the country that oppresses African Americans. Statues of Confederate war heroes or slaveholders are particular targets, but this fight over symbols is not new, nor is it external to Davis. This town has had conflicts over the years over symbols like the statue to Gandhi in Central Park and over naming a street for Edward Teller, who helped invent a hydrogen bomb. Melissa M. Bender is a senior lecturer in the University Writing Program and Associate Director of Writing Across the Curriculum at UC Davis and she co-edited a book that came out in 2019 titled Contested Commemoration in U.S. History, Diverging Public Interpretations with her co-editor, Clara Sluzak. The book has 11 essays by different authors on how we remember contested events in America, and the subject is timely, to say the least. Melissa, thank you for spending time with us today. Thank you for having me, Bill. I'm happy to be here. So in your you, uh, you didn't write the essays, but you, you wrote an introduction, and in the introduction you write that struggles to control national narratives through acts of commemoration reveal as much about the anxieties of the present as they do about the historical events or figures to be memorialized. You know, you're saying in effect that these disputes are about us, the people alive today, and that really is the main reason they matter, isn't it? It is, absolutely. I think that it's clear, especially with what's going on uh, right now with many of the monuments being removed or defaced or um, taken down during protests, just how much we have emotionally invested in the present in these statues and memorials that represent the past. Uh, you know, your introduction has two other points that I want to mention because I think they add real clarity uh, to this larger question. Uh, one is a comment from Mitch Landrieu, who was then the mayor of New Orleans, and mm -hmm. he was talking about a dispute they had there. He said the disputes are also about who's in charge. And can you elaborate on that? Sure. So one of the things that uh, Mitch Landrieu was referring to when he said that was the fact that uh, the Confederate monuments that he was working to take down in New Orleans at the time, which was 2017, had not been erected immediately after the Civil War, but at points when the white majority of New Orleans at that time wanted to reinforce racial supremacy. So during the era um, just after Reconstruction, when there was a revival of the Ku Klux Klan, and then later um, during the Civil Rights era, so he was saying that these monuments were constructed to reinforce racial hierarchy and to remind people who was in charge. So efforts to reinforce white power at, at that time. And, and so then in discussing taking them down, the point is to say basically a different view different people perhaps, but a different view is what's in charge. That's why the statues would come down now. Exactly, yes. And uh, I think I've got his name right. You also cite Seth Brueggemann, mm -hmm. a, a historian, who uh, says commemoration dwells almost entirely in feeling. Mm. And I took that to mean that when we're talking about this, we need to address the feelings evoked and not treat these disputes as if they were sort of a dispassionate factual calculation. Correct. Yes. I think, you know, the conversation that's going on about taking monuments down today seems to ignore that fact. And there's a lot of conversation in certain groups in the populace about the fact that our history is going to be lost if we take down the monuments. And that's certainly not the case. I mean, nobody's going to forget who Robert E. Lee was if we take down every single statue of him throughout the United States, he'll still be written about in history books. But the sense that we're losing something by taking down some of those monuments has to do with people's 
emotional relationship with that point in the past that they want to continue to commemorate and their sense that they're losing something personally that their history or their heritage rather i would use the word heritage and not history in that instance is going to be lost if we lose the statues you know you raise an interesting point there the the, the difference between the words heritage and history could you explain on that a bit Sure. I think that history uh, is an effort, and we're talking about the discipline of history, is an effort to draw a narrative around the facts of the past that presents the truth of the past, but interpreted by a particular historian. And we can never lose sight of the fact that um, it's always through a, a historian's perspective that we're getting that history. But heritage, I think, is a sense on, on the part of particular groups of a kind of personal ownership of a particular part of the past and a feeling that we have a connection to that moment or that era that is more than just the impersonal facts of what happened in the past. So the, uh, the book is written as, and it, it reads as, uh, you know, as an academic textbook. And so uh, this is for students, right? The point of the book is to analyze and present ideas and arguments and then to discuss them in a class? Absolutely, yes. Do you know that it's a fairly recent book? Has it been uh, used much yet for that purpose? Have you had feedback about that from anybody? Um, I've had feedback from a few instructors and in, actually in Europe who are teaching in American studies programs who have found that it's very useful for their students to get a grip on why, I mean, I think from those professors' perspectives, they're trying to give their students a sense of what's happening in the United States right now by helping them understand our connection to these controversial moments in the past and that the students have responded very well. One of the uh, strengths of the book, I, I think, is that uh, you have 11 different topics in there, and there's really a lot of variety to it. I mean, we've talked so far about statues, and I've talked about mm -hmm. the street name, but it's far larger. Um, right. Uh, one of the essays is about movies with an antebellum theme made during Barack Obama's presidency. Right. One is about to the homes destroyed to create Shenandoah National Park uh, in mm -hmm. the eastern United States. Another is on the depiction of female U.S. veterans of the Vietnam War both at the Memorial, uh, Vietnam War Memorial in Washington, but also in literature, and the fate of a house in Chicago where the chairman and a member of the Black Panthers were killed during gunfire with police in 1969. You know, this variety shows that the question of what to remember and forget, it's, it's really always with us, isn't it? I mean, sometimes maybe we notice it more, but it's always there. It is. I, I think that with regard to the variety of approaches in the book, it was something that Clara and I really made an effort um, at in including these different approaches. And I, if you read the book as a whole, I think that one of the senses that you get is, as you said, Bill, um, that this is all around us and that often as we're working our way through our everyday lives, we move past these places or these sites or these other commemorative efforts um, without really seeing them as points of commemoration. And so the book is bringing those moments out for the reader and those occasions out for the reader to see the very, very different ways that we um, commemorate the past. And I'm thinking in particular of one chapter in the book that analyzes the, the lyrics of uh, Woody Guthrie and Pete Seeger songs and how those songs commemorate the labor movement in ways that may have been otherwise lost because they weren't getting a lot of attention at the moment or in, uh, by historians. And also the chapter in the book that deals with high school yearbooks during the Japanese internment during World War II and how those, Japan, those high school yearbooks show us the absence of Japanese students 
who had, you know, one year been present in the yearbook and the next year they were gone. And so, you know, these different ways of commemorating the past that are represented in the book, I think provide the readers with a really strong sense of all the different ways that these things come up. And the yearbooks in particular is a reference to California's history. Uh, mm -hmm. as these are California yearbooks you're talking about during uh, the internment of, of Japanese Americans during World War II, uh, that they were seen as a security threat uh, to the country. Uh, we were at war with Japan. Yes. Um, overall, what do you want people to take from your book? Do you want them to see the variety of all this? Do you want them to think about this in new ways? Do you want them to reach certain conclusions? I would like readers to, after reading the book, think more consciously of whose voices and whose experiences are represented in our commemoration efforts throughout the United States, whose stories get told, what aspects of our history get glossed over or sanitized by some of our commemoration efforts, and to become, just have greater awareness when they're in the presence of a commemoration of any sort to think through those questions. I have a very personal connection to the idea that, that brought this book forward. And that has to do with my own personal history about learning about Japanese internment myself. I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And at, that, at the time that I was in high school, I don't think that we were anybody was teaching about the Japanese American internment. Maybe it was the time period that I was in high school. Maybe it was because I wasn't on the West Coast, but we didn't learn about it in our high school classes. And I didn't really know anything about it until I was um, late in my university years. And I went to Washington DC and saw a exhibit about it at the National History Museum. And it was, a huge shock to me <laughs> that, that this had happened, one, and two, that I was that age and I had never heard about it, that I was an adult and I didn't know about this really important and traumatic experience in our nation's history. And um, I think it was that ex early experience that drew me to the topic of this book, which is how we commemorate the more traumatic or egregious moments of our past or how we cover those things over. So, so that's a good point here, uh, I think, is there's lots of things to commemorate. I mean, some would be totally uncontroversial or, or even in our own times. I mean, I was thinking about this. We, we're not in really a statue building age all that much. Uh, it's more names on buildings. But one exception to that in my own lifetime has been to Martin Luther King. Right. Uh, there have been quite a few things named for him. But, but your point is, if I understand correctly, is it's the difficult commemorations maybe that we really need to pay attention to because we don't hear about them otherwise, perhaps. Or uh, maybe they have more to teach us as we try to grapple with our own identity as a country. Right. You know, who are we and what do we value? Yes. You know, I think uh, it's interesting for me because my co-editor is German. And I think about how Germany has handled commemorating the Holocaust in many very public and visible ways, including marking houses where Jewish citizens were taken from their home and taken into concentration camps. It's really hard to go anywhere in Germany without being reminded of the Holocaust in some very public ways. We haven't, um, as a nation, done that to as great of an extent with issues of slavery or with Native American genocide, among a number of other things. It's possible to move through large spaces without seeing any way of marking those traumas of our past. So in that way, I think the U.S. is quite different than some other nations and how they have handled it. We are talking with Melissa Bender. She is a senior lecturer in the university writing program at UC Davis and co-edited a book that came out in 2019 Contested Commemoration in U.S. History. I'm Bill Buchanan, and this is Davisville on KDRT. So one of the questions, of course, is what do you, what do, you do with a statue? What do you do, particularly if it's in a gray area? 
and I got this from your book as well, uh, that the choice for community deciding what to do uh, doesn't have to be either or. Right. Uh, for the example, in New York City, a panel established by Mayor Bill de Blasio uh, supported keeping a statue of Christopher Columbus, who is a controversial figure because of, uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, but while adding also a monument to indigenous people. And so that was New York City working out, at least at that time, how they wanted to to balance all that. And right. it, uh, I wondered, is, you know, is this tactically basically saying that sometimes, and of course, we're all pluralistic communities. Is this the way the community's pluralistic will to present balance and context rather than simply remove? This is one mm -hmm. tactic to approach it, I suppose, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, and I, I think the issue of the Columbus statue in New York City may be something that needs to be updated since the time that the book was written. I'm not sure what they've decided to do about that now in light of what's been happening throughout the U.S. with the removal of Columbus statues in other places. But yes, there are a number of different ways that communities can handle these issues. There's the counterbalancing effort, as you see in that example that you were um, just uh, citing from the book. I think in New Orleans, when Mitch Landry was taking down statues of Confederate uh, heroes, that his goal at that point was not to destroy the statues, but to house them in a museum at some point where they could be explained or contextualized in some way. Although at the time that he took them down, they were just being warehoused. So I'm, I'm not sure how far along they've gotten um, with that. So it really seems that the local communities need to decide on their own how to handle it. You know, I, I read there was a statue in Tennessee to a Confederate uh, general who, it, it, the, the statue is on private land, but it's so tall that it can be seen from highways all around. And the community voted to put in hedges high enough that it would block the view of the statue from the highway. I mean, that's another, you know, different kind of way of dealing with these issues. Yeah, lots of ways in. I, I, I alluded at the start of the hour, I mentioned that Davis has had some questions like this. Uh, the uh, Edward Teller dispute Davis resolved by deciding not to name a street for him. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, city deliberated about the Gandhi statue, uh, but has kept it. It's uh, still there in, in Central Park. Mm -hmm. So there are ways to work through this. And the, the hedges one I hadn't heard of, but uh, <laughs> in a way that's kind of classic American ingenuity. But you know, memorials rely on a consensus and, and a simplicity that might not currently exist. And, and so I wonder if, if ours really is an age for memorials or if ours is more of an age where you put a lot of things out there and maybe you encourage people to read widely or, or research widely, but you don't so much create these points and places unless there's just real clarity that eludes us right now in lots of areas. I agree. I think that, I mean, I think the idea of a monument itself is ostensibly to be a unifying symbol for a community or a way of saying this is what represents us this is a part of our past that we can all agree upon as representative of our community but unfortunately in many instances that decision about what gets memorialized in that way hasn't included a diversity of voices or a diversity of opinions and in some instances as we discussed when we were talking about Mitch Landry earlier, those choices of creating a unifying element for the community were deliberately exclusive, right? Deliber deliberately exclusionary. Yeah, and, and ultimately, I guess that's really what we're engaged with these days is we're saying, look, there are more voices in this country. You know, our ideal is pluralism. Our uh, ideal is everybody. Mm -hmm. and if we really mean that, then that has to be reflected in our public places as well. Absolutely. I mean, that's sort of a, uh, it's a dispassionate way of describing it, but, but I think that's the heart of it. 
Of course, it's not just the United States that's doing this. I, as I was researching for this show, I came across an essay by uh, Julian Baggini, who is an author. And this was in the Times Literary Supplement, dealing with a statue that was torn down in England of someone who had profited, uh, I think, also from the slave trade. Right. And his essay suggests uh, that statues be evaluated partly on why the person is celebrated. And so, in other words, in this country, well, there was a statue of U Ulysses S. Grant that was torn down in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ulysses S. Grant was a president, and he also led the Union Army that defeated the Confederacy. He did own a slave for a year or so on the eve of the Civil War. If I understand the history correctly, that was given, I, I hate using that word, uh, whatever word you want to use, mm -hmm. uh, by his in-laws, I think, and then he set the man free eventually. But the point is that uh, Grant then, if the statue's up there, it's probably not because of that. It's because he led the army, he led the Union Army in the war, and he was president. It's a way of looking at something that's not just either or. It's not just all of this person we're celebrating, you question none of it, uh, versus no, this one thing, uh, particularly that maybe wasn't all that unusual in his time, disqualifies any commemoration. Uh, I don't have an answer for that, but I thought that was an interesting way to kind of evaluate it, to sort of look mm -hmm. at it and say, we'll keep this one, this one we'll put in a museum. I would imagine though, of course, there's some that are beyond the pale. I can't imagine anyone wanting a picture or a statue of Hitler anywhere, right. for example. Right. What do you think of that approach? The idea of sort of evaluate why you're commemorating and not just all the details of the person's life. I, I agree with you on that. I think that that seems like a very logical and, and measured approach to this question of which memorials we keep in place and which we move or which we try to contextualize in some other way. And I think in addition to thinking about why somebody has been being memorialized in this way, we also want to think about what keeping that memorial in place now says about us today. And thinking about the legacy that we're going to leave for people in the future. When they look back, I mean, this is a moment that historians are going to write about because of so much is changing all at once. I mean, I think over 180 monuments have come down just since the George Floyd murder throughout the United States. Some by protesters taking them down and some by local groups saying, we want to take this down ourselves with um, the sanction of government. And I think that people are gonna look back at this moment and make judgments about us, about which choices we made, about the things that came down. And so we need to think about that too. Like what, is, what does it say about us in this moment? Um, that, that's part of the uh, complexity of interpretation, isn't it? I mean, how much do you want to interpret a historical figure in their era versus now? Right. Uh, because something that could have been very, let's say, progressive 100 years ago, now someone could look at and go, don't, don't like that. Uh, and mm -hmm. yet we all, we all live in our eras and uh, right. who knows what's coming ahead, but it will almost certainly make this era look strange, right. Right. whether it's by technology or attitudes or whatever it may be. Right. And um, historians live in their era as well, are limited by <laughs> yeah. the worldview that we have at the present when they're interpreting the past. You know, as we've discussed, uh, I, I've worked in the, the press over the years. One of the things that you get as a, as a journalist is people will say the media this, the media that. Right. And mm. my answer often was to say, read widely. Don't, if you feel it's monolithic, go beyond the monolith. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's, there's problems when things scatter too, because in, to some degree then, where do you find an accepted basis for truth if, if right. you, or at least the truth is you can get to it. But the point is, I think it's something similar here. It says, read widely, look widely. You'll get a better sense of the issues that way. Mm -hmm. And memorials, in a way, are like mainstream media used to be. Here's this one thing, this one place, this one right. square. And it's meaning to represent something larger, perhaps, than we will now countenance. And that's just part of the change. 
but mm-hmm. it gets down to the individuals. How do you deal with it? And so read widely, look widely, put it in context. So have you decided how you'd resp- resolve these displays of m- memorials? Um, I, I think that the best approach is at a local level for communities to come together and make decisions about how to handle. I don't think that I can say there's one correct way to do this, but certainly that community effort needs to include all the voices in that community about how they want to represent themselves through their public commemorations. And that should happen in a very democratic fashion through conversation. You know, I, I recently read about a family who they are descendants of a Confederate general and there is a statue to him in Virginia and they had in previous decades, you know, paid to have the statue kept up and they've recently come to the conclusion that they actually want to ask their local government to take it down. And uh, one of the things that happened that, that led to this change in their attitude toward the statue was that they met and became acquainted with the black descendants, <laughs> the African American descendants of this Confederate general. And, you know, they and they got together and started having conversations. And so, you know, the African American and the white side of the family came together over the monument, made a decision together. And I think that that may happen in other places as well. Um, Well, we're we're running, we've hit the end of the show. So I'll need to end it there, but that's a good story to end it on. So thank you, Melissa, for talking. Thank you for having me, Bill. We've been talking with Melissa Bender, a lecturer at the uh, UC Davis and co-editor of a new book on... Public commemorations. I'm Bill Buchanan. This is Davisville. Thank you for listening.